We have about 20 some people over in the baptism class, so we're going to be a little bit light this morning. Does that look like it's everyone out there? Well, welcome to Equipping Hour. Uh, For the women who are at the retreat, I apologize. This is going to be a rehash in August. But there is a good reason for that. I I heard from a number of women that they walked away from the hospitality retreat. We did a three-part, sort of four-part series on hospitality. And they were very motivated. Many people were very motivated to make changes in their life and in their home. But it put them in an awkward position saying, I don't want to lead my home. Husbands, here's all the stuff I learned. So there was probably a half dozen homes that said, can you, can you teach this stuff to the guys too? So, so we said, let's, uh, let's bring it to an equipping hour. Um, as you're going to see, hospitality is not a women's thing. It's not a uh, thing that only some of us do, but it's, it's a, a defining trait of Christians. So we're going to go back through that content, three-part equipping hour starting this week uh, while they're doing the, the baptism class, uh, three-part equipping hour on hospitality. So I just want to start by saying the gospel is the good news of God's hospitality to sinners. And so if if we go to the definition that I'm going to use of hospitality, I think it'll be helpful. Um, hospitality, you might have a ton of things in your mind, like hospitality industry, or um, you, know, you get magazines about how to entertain, get your house in, in perfect order. We're entering the holiday season. You, know, you have to have the, the right like, holiday plates, perfect decoration. Get your house in perfect order so you can have people over and impress them. That is not the biblical picture of hospitality. Rather, biblically, hospitality is treating those who aren't your family as if they are your family, especially in your home. Okay, so hospitality is treating those who aren't your family, who have no natural claim to be your family, no natural claim to your stuff, as if they are your family, especially in your home. And so let's, since I I think to understand why this is so definitional for the Christian, we need to remind ourselves of who we naturally are before God. Before salvation, the Bible describes us as children, as belonging, as children of a particular entity and belonging to a family. We we are not naturally God's children and we are not naturally God's family. Instead, we are children of wrath. You can go to the next slide. We are described as children of wrath, children of the devil, sons of disobedience, We're explicitly described as strangers to God's family. And you're going to see a very distinct contrast in the before and after, right? This puts into all that much more stark contrast and and should make us worship when we realize that we become children of God and that we're adopted into God's family. But before we jump forward to the good news, I want to open our Bibles and look at some of this bad news, this is who we are naturally before salvation. Adam was described in Luke 3.38 as the son of God. But after our, the fall, our, our relationship to God changed dramatically. Look in John 8.44. As Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, he says, you are of your father, the devil. And you might think, oh yeah, well, that's the Pharisees. They were the hypocrites. They were the ones that murdered Jesus. Surely that doesn't describe me. 
Surely that doesn't describe humanity in general. That has to be the really, really bad ones, the Pharisees, the scribes, and Hitler. They are, they are sons of their father, the devil. But then you go to 1 John 3.10, and John clarifies, everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God and is a child of the devil. That's 1 John 3.10. And don't worry if you're flipping and you're going all over the case, all over the place. I'm, I'm giving you a big picture, biblical survey of this before and after dynamic. So I'll try to give you the verses. It's okay if you can't flip to every single one, but I do need you to turn to Ephesians because we're going to be spending a lot of time there. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, a very familiar section, describes our natural familial relationship. What's so sweet is, is we're not importing a theology on top of this. We, we know very clearly, as you'll see, this, what, what we're talking about this morning was in Paul's mind as he went. Ephesians 1 starts with this glorious introduction to the, the doctrine of, of adoption as sons of God. And then he contrasts that with chapter 2, which we're going to look at now our natural position. Let's read in Ephesians 2, 1. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. This is describing every single person in here. It might still be describing some people in this room. Every single person, whether they are a Christian or whether they aren't a Christian yet, they were born into this natural state, dead in transgressions. You formerly walked according to the ruler of the power of the air. That's your father, the devil. And then look what it says. The spirit that is now working in, do you see that word? The son's of disobedience, among whom we all formerly conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the, the rest. Do you see those words? You, you have sons of disobedience, you have children of wrath, you have family language. Which family were we? Whose sons were we? You go to chapter 5, verse 6, and sinners again are referred to as sons of disobedience. We could go elsewhere uh, in the Bible. I, I, I don't want, we could do a whole sermon on this, on this point, but, but I, I do want to move on. In summary, before salvation, we were not God's family. And not merely not God's family. We belonged to the family of his enemies. But in salvation, God saves sinners. We're adopted as children. Go to the beginning of, of, the, uh, of John. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And we are going to be hearing news that hopefully all of you here have heard before. This is the gospel. And anytime we hear the gospel, the good news of God's love for sinners, for you and me, there's a danger and there's an opportunity. There's a danger to grow familiar. There's a danger to to look for something new, something maybe you hadn't heard before, to grow comfortable with the same old good news. And that's a danger, but there's also an opportunity. There's an opportunity to worship. There's an opportunity to marvel. There's an opportunity to evaluate, are you living in light, if you believe this gospel, 
Are you walking in a manner worthy of it? Everything that we're going to read, if you are a believer, actually happened to you. And if you're not yet a believer, God offers this amazing gift of adoption as sons to you if you will only turn from yourself and turn to him. So do not let your heart grow hard. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. So as we read, even pray now, God, soften my heart here. Make me to worship. Make me to respond rightly to this good news. This is amazing news. Let's read John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Remember whose children they were? Remember whose child you were, which family you belong to? And if you believe in his name, he gives you the right. He gives everyone the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. There was no natural claim to be a child of God. But born of God. Similarly, Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. The blessing of adoption is not for everyone. It is only for those who have faith. Every single human being without exception is naturally a child of wrath, a son of the devil, and only those who believe in Jesus' name and only through faith in Jesus Christ does one move from that position of damnation as enemies to the exalted position of adoption as sons and daughters. A mark of a Christian is that you actually agree with God that nothing good is in you, that you don't bring any natural claim to God. Maybe I can work myself into a position, God, where you say, oh, I want that one in my family. Nobody comes and says, God, adopt me because of, I can add to your stock. I can make your family better because of my natural position. No, you actually agree with God. No, I am dead. I am a child of wrath. I am a son of disobedience. Naturally, in and of myself, I only bring rebellion, only bring disobedience. God, will you change me from the core? Make me into your image. Make me like you. Make me your son. He adopts you, gives you the position as sons, with every right of the inheritance as sons, he also changes your nature to make you like him. We're going to be reading that. Marvel, and don't you dare, and I am preaching to myself now, don't you dare smuggle merit into this to say, I think God did that because I am good enough or some picture of religion. If I keep the rules just hard enough, if I keep just enough rules, if I honor God enough, he'll want me in, my fa in his family. No, you are in his family because of his purposes, by his grace, and then only because that has already happened does he now save you to walk in obedience and to glorify him through the good works that he prepared beforehand. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and prepare to marvel. Remember, this is a precursor to what we read in Ephesians 2. Do you remember Ephesians 2? Sons of disobedience, children of wrath. Look at this language. Look at the family language going on here. Blessed be the God and Father. We're in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Whose father is he? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Eternity past the Trinity. Perfect 
relationship, sinless. There is God, the Son. He deserves that position. He's the only one who naturally has claim to be called Son of the Father. And that God and Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world in eternity past. He chose us that we would be holy and blameless before him in love by predestining us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has graciously bestowed on us in the, in the beloved. Do you see here how much we bring to the picture? Do you see here how much we have to do with being saved? Uh, nothing. <laughs> But why were we saved? If you are in this, why were you saved? Well, it was because God had purposes that he predestined before the foundation of the world in grace for his glory. And he bestowed it on you. If you respond in faith. And even that we read in the next chapter is a gift that you can't even boast. So why did God do it? Why did God do it? He didn't respond to anything in you. But he says, love motivated him. Verse four. Verse five, the good pleasure of his will. He had purposes. And it was for the praise of his glorious grace. According to J.I. Packer in Concise Theology, he writes, in Paul's world, adoption was ordinarily of young adult males of good character to become heirs and maintain the family name of the childless rich. That is not what's going on here. God already had a perfect son. There was nothing deficient in God's family. Paul, however, proclaims God's glorious adoption of persons of bad character to become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Referring, you could read Romans 8 is replete with this language as well. God did not adopt us because he was childless, childless or because he could improve his family stock. Like Thomas Manton says, Listen to this. This is so good. The greatness of adoption is magnified when one considers the contrast between the person adopting the great and glorious God and the persons who were adopted. Miserable sinners. Puritan William Ames marvels. Human adoption was introduced when there were no or too few natural sons. But divine adoption is not from want, but from abundant goodness. Worship. Don't be unaffected as you hear who our God is and how he relates to you and me. Oh, may we walk in a manner worthy of this calling. It's like God did to Israel. You can read in Deuteronomy 7. God's been like this throughout all of eternity, throughout all of human history. Deuteronomy 7, he told Israel, Yahweh did not set his affection on you or choose you because you were more numerous or better than the other people's, but it was because Yahweh loved you. Do you see love is central to adoption? Love is central to treating those who have no claim on God's family as family. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you're going to see love is central to hospitality, where you actually get to mimic this with others. 
We'll get there. That's week two and three in the end of today. But don't miss God's love as the motivating factor here. All right, back to Ephesians. The argument of Ephesians 1 crescendos through the statements of predestined, un, predestination unto adoption as sons. Four times in chapter 1, Paul says that the ultimate purpose of our adoption as sons through Christ and then the sealing of inheritance as sons through the Holy Spirit. So four times he says sonship and inheritance. The purpose is to the praise of his glory and that it flows through the counsel of his will. It's not a response to anything he saw in us. So we're just going to sometime just read, maybe tonight, this afternoon, read Ephesians 1 and look for this language, this adoption, this sons, this, the sons, the connection to being, to being heirs and receiving an inheritance, and that the purpose is God's glory, not motivated in us. But we got to get forward. So get to Ephesians 2. And now let's go back to where we started and read in this context the contrast. We who were adopted, this is who we were. Verse 3, by nature children's, children of wrath, even as the rest. And you see that same purpose as you go forward to verse 7. Why did he do this? Why did he take us, who are children of wrath, sons of disobedience, and save us? Verse 7. So that in the ages to come, he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We see eternity set on two ends here. Eternity past, God for his purposes predestines us for adoption as sons so that on into eternity future, he can show us the surpassing riches of his grace. All for his glory. You see, God is the only one who when he magnifies himself, it benefits everybody. Everybody who's rightly related to him. God says, give me the glory. I'm doing this for my glory. Do you know how I'm glorified? For eternity, I get to show you surpassing kindness. In 10,000 years, we will have only begun to taste the first slightest bit of his surpassing kindness toward us. God adopted us by grace so that he could glorify himself by showing us kindness forever. He adopted sons of disobedience, children of wrath, his enemy. You understand why John, when he's contemplating this, just bursts forth in 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called sons of God. And so we are. This changes everything. <laughs> if, if this is true, and it is, what are you going to face in this life that you can't be like, it, God's my Father? Uh, I have eternity of receiving blessings at his right hand forevermore. Uh, what are you going to do to me? Uh, trial? Oh, it's from my father, so I know it's good. Blessings? Oh, it's just a precursor of what's to come. I'm not going to worship those things. I'm going to use them to honor my father. Gives you blessings and you see somebody in need? Especially your brother? Oh, God gave me this stuff for you. Let me share it with you. I, I love you because God loved you. We're reconciled together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's my stuff. Uh, you're not my family, but I'll treat you as my family because we actually are family because we've been reconciled to the same Father in grace. 
man, I wish we could just marvel, work through Romans 8 like we just did Ephesians 2 or 1 and 2. I think that would be foolish of me to do right now. Add that to your list of passages to read and marvel in this context. Big picture, blessings of adoption. Listen and marvel. We are made in adoption as partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1.4. We are indwelt by the spirit of God himself. Romans 8, 14 through 16 and Galatians 4, 6. We are fellow heirs with Christ of eternal life. Romans 8, 17, 23, 1 Peter 1, 4. Believers have been so highly exalted that Christ is properly called our brother. That sounds like it should be wrong to say. Oh yeah, the Lord of the universe, the one who created everything, by whom, through whom, for whom all things were created, to him be the glory. That's my older brother. That, that doesn't sound right to say. Uh, but Romans 8, 29 and Hebrews 2, 17 says that you can say it. Indeed, because Christ the sanctif- is the sanctifier and we have been sanctified through our one father, The Lord Jesus himself is unashamed to call us his brothers. That's Hebrews 2, 11 through 12. (laughs) What do you do with that but worship? And glorify God with your life. So that's just point one. In salvation, God made us his children. Do you remember... Before salvation, whose child you were? And then do you remember what it said? Whose household you were? So, so, so you were children of the devil, children of wrath, sons of disobedience. And household-wise, um, we were... I just blanked on the, on the, the, the household. We were... Um, by nature, children of wrath. Sorry, I'm, we're going to go go ahead to, to Ephesians chapter two, and let's marvel at the, our household relationship changing. We are made members of the household of God. This is Ephesians two nineteen. So we're going to continue on in Ephesians. We saw God changing us from a household to, or making us his children. And he changes our household. He, he makes us, takes us from one family to another. We can see, see that in Ephesians 2. He builds towards it by, by talking of the, the changing relationship in the church between Gentiles and Jews. Right? Gentiles and Jews alike were all dead in our trespasses and sins. All of mankind, Jews and Gentiles, were children of wrath and sons of disobedience. But the Jewish people, Israel, they, they already had irrevocable covenants of promise. God called them out as special people. We already saw why, not because they were so numerous or they were better, but because of God's love. And he promised that one day all of Israel would be saved. He would take away their sins and change them from their heart. And that God would be their God and they would be his people. It's the new covenant. Jews had received God's word and God had revealed himself to humanity through his word, which came through Abraham's line. The Messiah would come through that line. But uncircumcised Gentiles though, I mean, Ephesians 2.11, had none of those promises or privileges. They were alienated from Christ and separated from Israel. They were, look at this word, strangers. That's going to come up later. They were strangers to God's promises. Right before God showed his love to Abraham, he too was a stranger to God's promises, and those people were... But Gentiles, 
They were strangers to God's promises and even alienated from God's people. Um, yeah, just hang on to that word, strangers. It's going to come up. Gentiles and Jews, therefore, were at odds with each other. And this was an ever-present reality at the time of this writing in Ephesians. It's actually been an ever-present truth since the very first Jews. This Jew-Gentile hostility of the world, it created problems in the early church as God brought Jews and Gentiles together into one body. So in verse 13, Paul helps them understand their changed relationship to each other. In Christ, you who were formerly far off, Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace. The two groups, Jews and Gentiles, became one and were reconciled in one body to God through the cross. Verse 14, the dividing wall of partition, the temple wall that kept Gentiles separated from the areas of worship, previously reserved only for Jews, it's been torn down. And indeed, the temple veil was torn down. And now we all, verse 16, Jew and Gentile alike have been reconciled to God in one body through the cross. And now as Romans 8, 14 says, God himself and the Holy Spirit leads us. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are adopted as sons of God. This is a wonderful reality of the church. Our unity together. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek or anything else. If you are saved, you have peace with God and peace with each other in one body that is through the church. Big picture, what are we saying? Our relationship to God has been changed. Our relationship to one another has been changed. Look down at verse 18. The whole Trinity is at work in this. Jew and Gentile, by the same Holy Spirit, through Jesus' blood, have access to the same Father. Holy Spirit, through Jesus' blood to the Father, all three members of the Trinity at work, changing our relationship to God, changing our relationship to one another. And Galatians 4, 6 talks about this. Romans 8, 15. And both of those comment that the same one Holy Spirit that's for Jews and Greeks Listen to this in terms of the familial relationship. I hope this changes maybe a familiar verse to you. It makes us all, Jew and Gentile, cry out from our changed hearts to the same Father, Abba, Father. Do you see what this means? We all have the same Father. We all have the same Abba. Because we've been saved by the same Son and given the same Spirit, we've been united into the same body. And I, I know I've been rushing through this, but it's been to get to verse 19. So if you've been lost, look down at 19. This is where it all comes together. So then, because of all that, I, I couldn't skip all of that run-up because it's so, looks back, then looks forward. You are no longer strangers. Looking back, you remember I said the, that word strangers? The, the Gentiles were strangers to the covenants. You're no longer strangers. Xenos, that's the Greek word. Xenoi. And sojourners. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. See that language? The household language, you have strangers made family. Strangers to God, strangers to each other, united as family. One way to express the gospel is to say that strangers, I, Greek word xenoi, and I'm going to tell you why that matters later, have been made, treated, as family, as God's family, at a great cost because of God's great love. God made us members 
of the household of God, and in so doing, he reconciled us to himself and united us to our new brothers and sisters. Hugh Binning wrote, Puritan guy, Puritans are so good on this. He wrote that to claim to be a son or daughter of God is a higher word than if a man could deduce his genealogy from an uninterrupted line of a thousand kings and princes. There is more honor, true honor in it, and more profit too, for spiritual adoption enriches the poorest and ennobles the basest inconceivably beyond all the imaginary degrees of men. Jeremiah Burroughs stated it even more strongly by quoting Luther's comment that if we did but know what this privilege of adoption were, all the riches of all the kingdoms in the world would be as filthy dung to us. God changed our relationship to him, changed our relationship to each other, and put us in this amazingly highly exalted position all together, united as family. So Alexander Strzok, if this is awakening a desire to learn more, I, I strongly commend the book Hospitality Commands by Alexander Strzok. Have it on a book table. He writes, the reality of our brotherly and sisterly relationship. Hear this. This isn't just in this passage, but the reality of our brotherly and sisterly relationship super saturates the New Testament. It super saturates it. It's all over. Although the New Testament writers do use different images to describe the nature of the church, like the body the bride, the temple, the flock, those are all helpful illustrations in their right. But the most frequent New Testament term for Christians is the family, particularly the fraternal aspect of the family that were brothers and sisters, brethren. The first Christians always referred to each other as brother and sister. That's in the New Testament some 250 times, particularly in Paul's letters. Peter directly refers to Christians as the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2.17. And I'll tell you what is so amazing. Jesus had making us his brothers and sisters on his mind. I think of first importance when he died on the cross. Go to John 20, 17. John 20, 17. So this is Jesus has died. He's risen from the dead. After purchasing our adoption at the cross. And listen to what he had in mind first. He could have said so many things. He, he sees Mary. And he goes, I have not yet ascended to the Father. But what he, he could have said, but go and tell the disciples that I'm alive. But go and tell the disciples that forgiveness is now available. Go and tell the disciples that I've conquered death. But what does he say? That would have all been true. But what does he say? What's first on Jesus' mind? He doesn't say go to the disciples. <laughs> He says, go to my brothers. He purchased their adoption at the cross. And he goes, it's finished. We're family now. I've risen. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. At the cross, Jesus accomplished this. He is not ashamed to call us his brothers. He, he actually glories in it, and it was the first thing on his mind even before he ascended to the Father. 
Strzok teaches, Paul or says, Paul teaches that Jesus, Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers, Romans 8, 29. So real is Christ's brotherly solidarity with all his blood brought, bought brothers and sisters that he says, whatever is done for one of his brothers and sisters is equally done to him. Conversely, to sin against a brother or sister is to sin against Christ. That's Matthew 5, 25, 40, which you do to the, the least of these. My brothers, you've done unto me. 1 Corinthians 8, 11 through 12 says that to sin against a brother is to sin against Christ. So don't skip over the word Brothers or brothers and sisters in the New Testament. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes you read the Bible, you get comfortable with it, and there's like throwaway words. Uh, for, for some reason, before this study, I have to confess, brothers sort of became, was a throwaway word. It, it was a word that just, oh yeah, he's describing Christians. He's just talking to the recipients of this letter and had to call them something. That's not the way the New Testament uses this. That's not the way Jesus uses it. And not only did brother and sister language or become the language of the New Testament, but the watching world, it was so obvious the change in relationship that was going on in the early church that the watching world had to acknowledge it. Grace Bible Church, this needs to be going on here. If, if a stranger came in from the outside, they'd be like, there's something weird in that church. They, they're all one big family. It's, it's, it's sort of unnerving. It's sort of odd. They're, they love each other. Like, I've only seen that kind of love in a family, but this love is even better than that. Listen to what uh, the pagan Cecilius criticized early Christians for. This is, uh, this is recorded in, in an ancient Latin work named, called Octavius. This was taken as an insult. He says, hardly have they met when they love each other, those Christians, indiscriminately, they call each other brother and sister. The pagans were forced to say, see how they love one another? By this, the world will know that you're my disciples and you have love one for another. And Jesus accomplished that love for us when he loved us first and then made us brothers and sisters in Christ. So before salvation, we're not God's children, right? We're children of wrath and we're not God's family. In salvation, we've been adopted as God's children. We've been made members of the household of God and we're united to our new brothers and sisters, laterally and to, to Jesus himself. So after salvation, love. After salvation, we have love. The great commandment is love the Lord our father. And the second one's like it, love your neighbor, especially your brothers. Let's turn to 1 John and see the way that the gospel empowers us to keep this command. Right? You don't love out of, all right, I'm going to muster up love, or if I, I, I got to love so that God loves me. Uh, that's all backwards. 1 John 3.10. By this, look at this language. I hope you see it now. It's all over the New Testament. <laughs> By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. Which family are you in? How do you know? Everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God, as well as the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that, you, that we should love one another. Just skim forward. Just look at verses 12 through 14. Do you see the word brother all over those? Each verse contains it. This is in John's mind. Uh, he heard the first thing, right? Jesus said to Mary, hey, go, go tell my brothers that I'm ascending to my father and their father. Uh, he started this chapter, 
Uh, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. This should overwhelm us into love for one another. But God's love is primary. Ours is secondary. It's true that love is the mark of the Christian because when God saves us and adopts us as children, he is forming us into his likeness. His likeness is one of love. And we know that because that we love because God showed it to us first. 3.16, 1 John 3.16, by this we know that love, he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for who? The brothers, our brothers. But God's love is primary, ours is secondary. Flip forward a, a, a chapter, 4.10, 1 John 4.10. In this is love. How do we know what love is? True love for the brothers. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent, he could have used a lot of words to say who he sent, but he sent his son to be the propitiation of our sin. Beloved, recipients of God's love and beloved by John, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another culminating in 419. We love because he first loved us. God's love is the foundational example and basis of our love. 420. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Christians, love for your brother is not optional. If you say you love God and you hate your brother, liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So far we've been speaking of agape love. But even agape love has this brotherly connection to it all over these verses. But there's a, another special kind of love that Greek could express that, that Christians could uniquely understand. You've maybe heard of the, the different Greek terms for, for love. The one I have in mind here that the Bible uses is Philadelphia. Right? The, the, city, the city of brotherly love. It's because Philadelphia means brotherly love. And according to Strzok, the Greeks did not use the term Philadelphia or the, the term brotherly love to refer to a spiritual brotherhood or friends. That term in, in extra church Greek was only used to describe the love between siblings or perhaps family relations. That brotherly love was reserved for family, that word Philadelphia. But Christians could naturally use this word, and they did, and we do, for their life together. To the brand new believers at Thessalonica in 1 Thess 4.9, Paul says, now as to Philadelphia, now as to brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Or 1 Peter 1.22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere Philadelphia, sincere brotherly love, fervently love one another from the heart. Romans 12.10, be devoted to one another in Philadelphia in brotherly love. Hebrews 13.1, let Philadelphia continue. Let brotherly love continue. You know what's crazy? In those last three verses I talked about where Philadelphia is used, it immediately flows into the command, get to do what? Be hospitable. And that's because the word hospitality, do you remember how I said pay attention to the word strangers? Xenia or xeno, xenoi, that means strangers. And now pay attention to the word Philadelphia. Do you know what the word, the Greek word for hospitality was? 
it was a combination of Philadelphia and Xenoi, Philoxenia, or Philoxenia. The Greek world didn't know what they had on their hands. That was just their word. It's, Christians saw that word, and they said, that's ours. Brotherly love towards strangers, that's what we do. That's what we were saved for. Right? Hospitality was esteemed in the world. It was actually something that was honored. You were honored when you did that. It, it, you would be dishonored. It would be a shameful thing not to show hospitality in, the, um, in that Greek world or especially in the, in the Hebrew world. But nobody could do hospitality, this brotherly love towards strangers, like those who have actually been united as brothers to strangers. Right? You could do hospitality. A lot of cultures still have this. I, I think it's, it's in Papua New Guinea, Jeremy was telling me. You, you, oh, let me show you honor. Let me show, let you have my stuff, treat you as family, because then you owe me one. <laughs> I have one coming. Uh, you, I might get it back later. Or let me show you hospitality because now I will be esteemed in the eyes of all the watching world. They'll know that I have riches and they'll know I'm a really good guy because I show hospitality. That's not the Christian motive, right? The Christian motive is not like that of the world and, and because we actually are united as brothers to strangers. Because remember, we once were strangers, we were far off, and we've been made members of the household of God. So now, and united together, that's why I went through all that theological precursor to this, because now it sets us up to understand when you see the word hospitality, which break it down into its parts, brotherly love towards strangers, you say, oh, I'm not faking it. The world's faking it. I'm not faking it. I am actually doing what comes naturally to my new nature because I've been reconciled to God and reconciled to my brothers as true family. And now you understand why in James 2, the mark of the Christian, the mark of faith is what? He goes, if you have a faith that says, I believe in God, but you lack works, can that faith save you? No, because faith, if you actually believe this gospel message, you will have love for your brothers. So listen to James 2. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and be filled and yet doesn't give him what is necessary for the body. What use is that? If you look at your true brother or sister in Christ and you say, now nah, I'm keeping my stuff. Do you believe? You just revealed. You remember what, who John said? Your, what that reveals about your relationship to God? Or Jesus, speaking of the tribulation saints in Matthew 25. He said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Jesus wasn't in any of those places in the tribulation. Who was? Christians. And so he's speaking to tribulation saints of the way they treated their, tribula their other tribulation saints. And he says, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done unto me. Similarly, all the major New Testament commands to practice hospitality appear within the context of brotherly love. So this will set us up for the next two weeks. We're going to look at the, the three major verses just so you have them before you. And then we'll wrap it up. And we're going to spend our time in these, these passages in the next weeks. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. How is love genuine? Well, 
being devoted to one another in Philadelphia, pursuing hospitality. Those are marks of genuine love for Christians. 1 Peter 4, 8. I think that's the next one, right? Yeah. Above all, be fervent in your love for one another. Be hospitable to one another. And then Hebrews 13, 1 through 2. Let, hospi- let Philadelphia continue. Let the love of brothers continue. Do not neglect, and that show hospitality to strangers, do not neglect Philoxenia. You see the, the brotherly love um, and um, hospitality connected so clearly there. This is what I think Paul had in mind in Galatians 6.10. Do not grow weary of doing good. You'll reap in due season if you do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially the household of faith. Why? It's easy when you are giving, giving, giving to grow weary. Right, you have somebody over to your house, somebody from church, especially the hard to love. They don't put the dishes away. They track dirt all over your home. They don't speak like you wish they would speak and they leave a mess and they don't leave when they should. Whatever, and you do that time after time. It can be wearying. You give your stuff, nobody noticed but the Lord. You have people into your home. I promise, if you have people into your home, there will be more blessing than there will be trial. But Paul says, don't don't grow weary in doing good. You'll reap in due season at a time if you don't give up. Since we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, but especially the household of faith. So when you consider hospitality, opening up your home, opening up your life, there will be a cost. Weariness will be possible. But don't think first about the what or the how, which maybe was your thought when you first think, okay, we're going to learn about hospitality. Okay, I'm going to need to figure out how to have people in my house. It's really small. Or it's a mess. Or I'm not used to doing this. Or what are we going to do with their kids? Or you write all of these what's and how's flood your mind. These hurdles, these difficulties. Oh man, if I have them over, they might stay late. I got to get up early and I have work tomorrow. All this stuff will flood into your mind. Don't do that. The what and the how, that's important. But don't think first and most about the what or the how. But be overwhelmed by the why. We were far off. We were strangers to God. We had no right to call him father. No claim on his family. But he adopted us as sons and daughters at great cost to himself. Far greater cost than you and I will ever give. And now we ought to remember God's love towards strangers and be defined by brotherly love towards those who were once strangers to us, but now are our blood-bought brothers and sisters. Let's pray. God, thank you. Father, thank you. I say Father to you. I can't possibly comprehend what that means. But your word helps us get close. And when I recognize, when we say thank you for your love, oh, how you've loved us, I can't even begin to understand. But your word helps us get close. And God, I pray that we would saturate our minds and our hearts with your word, and particularly this gospel message that saved us. In your love,
towards us, God, please, please, please let us show that to one another. I pray that it would start now as we have strangers, those who weren't our families, but are now our brothers and sisters in Christ coming through the door of the church. I pray that each one of us would abound in brotherly kindness towards one another. I pray that there would be hospitality today, lives opened, people cared for. And most of all, I pray that your purpose in saving us would be accomplished, which is the praise of your glory, the praise of your glorious grace. May that happen here as we gather as your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.